My name is Ken Krasnow. I'm the Vice President of Omnichannel Marketing at Henkel. Uh, we are a global consumer packaged goods company uh, with brands that I'm sure you know, love, and use every day in laundry, home care, and beauty. Brands such as All, uh, Persil, Purex, Snuggle, RightGuard, Dial, Soft Scrub, Combat, Renews It, Loctite, and many, 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 many others. And I'm super excited to be here with you today to talk to you about brand humanity in the digital age. And this theme is really all about consumer centricity and really lines up really nicely with all the things that we've been talking about and listening to over the last couple of days. In, in, in the essence, basically, is how Henkel is using digital data and technology um, for all of the unique capabilities that these things offer to breathe new life into our brands, to create communities and narratives that consumers feel passionate about, so passionate that they'll co-create the brand with us and carry our message forward. Um, and I'm making the case for brand humanity in the digital age because I need as many people inside my organization and outside the organization to join on this mission of doubling down on this notion of consumer centricity, really moving from this product-oriented focus you know, to really thinking about the consumer first. Um, a lot harder than maybe some of you would imagine. Um, in order to bring this vision of, of brand humanity to life, I need to do two things. I need to, number one, release searing insights that enable us to really unearth big ideas. To do that, I've got to break down silos in my organization, physical silos and mental silos. I also need to bring the consumer into view. The clearer the picture I get, the more I'm going to know about their hopes, their dreams, their motivations, their behaviors. Number two, I've got to focus on creating big ideas, but different ideas, different narratives, ideas and narratives that can lead to great consumer experiences and epic marketing content that can feed the entire marketing funnel. So SAP you know, came out with a study last year, and I thought this was really interesting because they were talking about, they talked to actually 5,000 consumers, they put 50 brands in front of them, they talked to some industry folks, and they really wanted to understand the difference between product and consumer-oriented companies. And they looked across two dimensions, consumer perception and brand focus. And I pulled out some themes here that I thought would be relevant to the group. Uh, from a consumer per uh, perception perspective, um, consumers that view a brand as product-oriented say that they look up to these brands. There's a certain awe, there's a certain reverence. Brands like BMW, brands like Hilton, brands like Gillette. Consumers that talk about brands as being really consumer-oriented look at brands as really partners, enablers, making their lives easier and better. Consumers that see brands as product-oriented, say these brands see me as a customer of the brand. And normally, wouldn't, we wouldn't say that's a bad thing. But for me, that was a real paradigm shift when you look at what consumers say about consumer-oriented brands. They see me as a user of the brand. So think about that for a second. Customer of the brand is very one-dimensional. It's transactional only. A user of the brand encompasses everything and opens us up as marketers to really new levels of empathy and thinking about all the various touch points that a consumer comes in contact with us on and how can we make those touch points even better. Um, the brand focus, uh, for product-oriented companies, these companies are really focused on positioning the brand in the mind. Consumer-oriented companies are a little less ethereal. They're about positioning the brand in people's lives. Product orientation, they, create, they are looking to create demand to buy the product. Consumer orientation, create demand for the use of the product. Product orientation, all about promotion. Consumer orientation, much more about advocacy and investing in post-purchase activities that bring people back into the fold to create a virtuous cycle of engagement that gets more personal and value added, the more somebody interacts with a brand, and the better we do that, the tighter that loyalty loop gets, right? So it's really worth investing 
um, in that. Product orientation, really emphasizing what we say to consumers. Boy, I hear that a lot. I'm in a lot of meetings, and we talk a lot about what we're going to talk about. We can't wait to get out there and talk a lot about ourselves. Um, consumer orientation, really interested in listening to what consumers have to say to one another. Product orientation, shaping the brand perception along the path to purchase versus influencing the customer experience at every touch point. Product orientation, really interested in impressions versus engagement metrics on the consumer orientation side. And there are some legacy brands like the ones you see here that are really getting this right and have really made the leap into providing more value, expanding that value proposition for consumers and becoming more consumer oriented. Now we know that digital is part of our everyday life. And we know that digital, the more we interact with digital, the more signals we leave out in the world. And those signals reveal enough about us as people for marketers to do some pretty neat things, right? So we know that marketers, whoops, excuse me, can deliver the right message to the right consumer at the right time on the right device within the right context. That's pretty cool. Um, what we can also do with this data trail that consumers leave for us, particularly when we stitch that together with the offline data that we have available to ourselves, is we can really understand much more about them and start to make these brand experiences feel more personal, feel warmer, feel more caring, feel more responsive, uh, feel more like kind of a human interaction. So that gets us to this whole question well, what is brand humanity anyway, and why is it important? Well, brand humanity, you know, is not a new concept. It's really the personification of a brand, right? And why do marketers do this? Because marketers are looking to build that emotional tissue between the product and consumers. And, you know, people relate best to other people. Feel, people feel most connected to other people, right? So this is the, we're trying to infuse these human characteristics into our products. I mean, if you think of brands like Nike or Apple or Starbucks, I'm sure you could all ascribe very, very human traits. You know, if Nike was standing in the hall waiting to come into this room, if they were a person, you could all describe kind of who they, they would be. Starbucks, you might say, gosh, they're really laid back. They're friendly. They've got a, they love hanging out with lots of diverse people. So that's the whole notion there. And marketers are really smart because they know that as humans, we're hardwired to evaluate people and brands the same way. We look across two dimensions, right? We look across competence, how skilled are you, and we look across demeanor, right? Um, you know, how do you make me feel? And in today's day and age, it's more important to think about the, the latter, the demeanor. Of course, we need to be competent, but it's harder and harder to separate our brands based on excellent product features and benefits. How many people in this room have experienced a bad product, you know, recently? A really just awful product. You're right? I, the last time I experienced a really bad product was in college when I went to Supercuts, right? And I got the worst haircut. As you can tell, I haven't cut my hair since. Um, horrible experience. But beyond that, most brands I come in contact with are really terrific. But why do I buy then Patagonia, right? I can get a great jacket that's super warm for probably half the price. So it's not the competency piece, it's the demeanor piece. Every time I open up a Patagonia catalog, which is really not a catalog, it's a lifestyle magazine, and I see the pictures and I read the editorials, I'm flooded with warmth, right? I'm flooded with memories of adventures that I've been on with my family outdoors, fishing in Montana, skiing in Killington in Vermont, and all of the adventures that I look forward to having. I know that they're, that they're caring, they care about the same things I care about, and they demonstrate that time and time again with regards to the environment, and they're super responsive. So they feel very human to me, and as such, they've got me, and they've got me for life. And I would say, I would argue that as marketers, I think we've always thought of ourselves as being in the idea business. And I'd ask you to think about that. Maybe we're really in the relationship business. Maybe in the 21st century, what we really need to be doing is collecting relationships, really, at every interaction point becomes another opportunity 
to please somebody and bring them into the fold. And maybe at the end of the day, that's really what these big ideas are supposed to do. And I think for me and my organization, that's a really important orientation, right? Because there are a lot of headwinds facing us today that we've got to be really careful about. Number one, I mean, we know that consumers are in total control, right? And they're ad blocking us and filtering us out in umpteen different ways. They've got more power, which we've talked about over the last couple of days, than, than people have ever had before. And, you know, they just don't trust what advertisers are saying anymore. Um, and they want meaningful content. We've been talking about that. Um, so we need to really listen and think about how can we build these relationships and collect these relationships, because if we don't, we're headed for a lot of trouble. McKinsey says that we're entering a highly disruptive extinction event. And you can see here by the precipitous decline of the Fortune 500 company lifespan, which used to be about 100 years, right, is now somewhere around 20 years. Because there are consumer-centric companies that are stealing share and stealing hearts and minds. So how do we motivate change? How do we get people on board with this notion of brand humanity in the digital age? This notion of really collecting relationships and being in the relationship business. It's a whole new prioritization. Um, humans are naturally suspicious of change. So what are you gonna do? Well, the first thing that you know, I did when I came to Hankel is work with management to break down the physical silos. You know, because we think that creativity and innovation really lies in the shadows of these silos. So that was you know, kind of number one. Uh, number two uh, is really getting people on board with this notion of building relationships by collecting data right, at every single touch point. Now, my organization, the Omnichannel organization, um, consists of all the consumer touch points. So that's media, digital marketing, shopper marketing, national promotions, in-store merchandising, uh, the consumer call center, and packaging design. And I may be forgetting one, but I think it's, that should add up to seven. And, um, and, and the neat thing about that is we can all be on this mission because there are structures in place. I put, we put omni-planning tools in place. Beyond the vision, we put the tools in place. We've put um, goals in place that everybody can kind of rally around. And the neat thing is we saw success early on in the form of more consumer-centric, bigger ideas. So this is Melody McDonald. She sits right outside of my office. I took a little picture of her before I came down here because she's my hero. Right? What did she do? She's reading these letters out loud, and because we have no silos and everybody sits around each other, and she's just like, you know, overjoyed and giggling. And people around her are like, Melody, what is going on? She goes, they're writing us love letters. I'm like, what? I mean, is that personal time or is that business time? And she said, no, they're writing us love letters about Priscilla. And I started to read some of these love letters and others started to you know, kind of gather around these physical letters. One woman wrote us a letter about Priscilla and she was saying that her husband, who was not an effusive man, uh, came home from work one day and was, was, was praising her for um, doing such great laundry and how great it made him feel. You know, how great he felt wearing these clean clothes and smelling so good. And she was just so overjoyed by this interaction with him that she wrote us this beautiful letter. And we went online and we started to look at all these ratings and reviews, and they're stellar. I mean, it's not just five stars. I mean, it's really people pouring their hearts out over laundry detergent. So we took, you know, this idea to the brand teams and we said, in an age where consumers don't believe what advertisers are saying, but they believe what strangers are saying, why don't we make the voice of the consumer, right, center to our campaign? And they loved the idea. And so all we did was we just pushed, put a little media behind some of these ratings and reviews, and we saw a lift in sales. So much so that the next year we came up with a campaign called Take the, Deep, uh, the Persil Deep Clean Challenge. Now, since I come from Pepsi, I'm not saying I stole the idea, but I was inspired by the idea you know, of the Pepsi Challenge. And uh, this is also working out really well for us, where we're, you know, we're, we're asking consumers to try Persil over their their current brand, and that's working great. And we're videotaping, right, what they're saying about the product and taking this whole kind of ratings and reviews to the next level, leveraging digital for its unique capability to capture, you know, emotion and disseminate that. And that's also working out really, really well for us. So bringing the consumer into view is another thing that I've talked about. 
And so it's, it's, it's certainly you know, listening, like Melody does, and sharing those insights. But we're also leveraging artificial intelligence. We've talked a little bit about that here. Um, and we are leveraging artificial intelligence to find the hidden shopper. So shoppers that should be buying our brands, but aren't. Or shoppers that should be buying more of our brands that aren't. And we're feeding the machine disparate data, structured, unstructured data. And the machine has come back to us with archetypes. It's telling us, because we can look at over 240 attributes at the zip code and the block group level, um, and we can prioritize these block groups that are high potential based on score, scoring system. And because we have all these attributes, we can build a composite of who these people are. And we can develop creative that fits their lifestyle. So for example, for active boomers, we're featuring boomers. We have a tagline that talks to their lifestyle based on our understanding. Same thing with diverse millennials and cultured empty nesters. And this is working out extremely well for us. From an engagement perspective, we are beating benchmarks by 8.5%. Sales are also looking good. We're going to have our sales lift study back on November 28th, so I'm you know, waiting for this. I'm very excited about it. But we think it's going to be absolutely stellar. So we're very excited about this campaign. Bringing the consumer into view, into view also means collecting data, as I said before. One of the ways I've helped to break down silos in the organization is everybody's on the same treasure hunt and on my team. We're all looking for data. We're looking for exposure files, cookie data. We're looking for device IDs. We'll take registration data. You got it, we'll take it. Right? So I got my consumer call center. I've got my shopper marketers. I've got my media folks. I've got my digital marketers. I've got my packaging people, all thinking about how can we bring data back into this organization, right? To then bring it into our, oops, bring it into our DMP and do some really cool things. Now, we talk about the importance of, you know, first party data. Uh, cookies are not gonna be enough, right? So, you know, ad exposures are not gonna get us all the way to bright. We don't sell directly to consumers, so we have to find ways of getting consumers uh, to, to come to us and give us some of their personal information. So we need to expand that value exchange. And what we're doing is we have a CRM program, and that CRM program is going to provide lots of laundry tips and tricks and all that type of thing. But we're also creating some really fun content. And I told some of you earlier today that um, we want to deliver the brand efficacy message, but we want to do it in a way that's fun and that's humorous. And we've come up with a campaign, a series of, uh, of, of video, a video series called GSI. So ripped from the headlines, not CSI, but Grime Scene Investigators. And we've actually hired the uh, you know, producers and directors that have worked on CSI to give this series the aesthetic of CSI. So that when someone comes across our video, they may feel they're watching you know, this type of program. They're going to find out really quickly that it's a very different world. Uh, and although we have two detectives, uh, they're um, not quite the ones you might find on CSI. So I'll give you a little flavor of, uh, of what they're all about. Investigators, and we'd like to invite you to make your community so you can find answers and solutions to all your food problems. To the right, That's right. You don't try to So, in addition to GSI and that series, which we hope people find super informative, as these Folks come to um, various households and situational scenes where there's these huge messes that they have to uncover. And uh, they do always solve the crime, and our products just happen to be the hero. Uh, but it's done in a way that I think is fun and engaging and also useful, providing very meaningful tips and tricks on how to deal with, with um, household uh, issues. Um, in addition to you know, this video series, we're looking at podcasts as well. And we've got something a little bit more serious. We've got a podcast coming out called City Mom, Country Mom. And this is basically about civility. 
it's basically showing how two working moms can come together from very different backgrounds with very different points of view, how there can be tension, but they will show how they can come up with solutions that everyday moms face, um, better solutions because of the diversity, right? Because of the diversity of thought. And uh, we think that this is gonna be a heck of a lot of fun. It's tested very well. And we're looking forward to really being publishers of really great content that bring people in to our story where they're going to subscribe and anticipate what we have to um, deliver back to them. All of this data we're going to feed into our data management platform so that we can create personas and really bring the consumer into view. So one of the things that we're doing is we are working with a, a CDP called Zeta. And so while we have, we're building our first party data store, it's really not enough at this point to develop a segmentation or personas, which is really where we're, where we're starting. We're not at the 360 view of the individual consumer. We want to get there, but we're not. But this particular partner of ours has a data cloud. And in that data cloud, they have their own first party, our, sec our second party data, that is deterministic. Right? They've got, they power um, the Discuss platform, which basically powers every single um, comments, um, the functionality of comments on, I think it's over 5,500 sites. They've got um, a, a company they own called Placed IQ, which is basically a mobile device company, and it's, uh, they've got over 200 million phones in their device store. Um, so this is all really rich, deterministic data. We can take this data, and bump it up against our first party data to build a richer picture of who the consumer is and really start to understand and segment these consumers. Now this seg type of segmentation is dynamic. It's not like you do it once and you're done and it lives in a draw. No, we're, we're on a journey here and we'll keep learning. As we get more and more data, these segments will change and morph. We'll score these segments because we don't believe all segments are gonna be equal. Um, and we'll focus our advertising you know, in a much more precise way. Now, we're also gonna go out and talk to consumers. So not everything is gonna be digital. Um, we are talking to consumers to really understand them uh, on a deeper level. We're really looking to create empathy maps. We wanna understand what are all the micro moments that are relevant uh, to us as it pertains to shopping and using the products within our categories. And when I say relevant, there may be some moments that sure, they're relevant, but we, don't really, we can't really solve for you know, every single problem. But what are the problems that we can elevate? What are the, the kind of the highs that we may be able to amplify so that we can ultimately understand what you know, they're thinking, feeling, and doing and the implications for us? So I'm not gonna clear this, but it's just really to show you that all of this insight should help us really live up to where this economy is, which we've talked about numerous times over the course of the last couple of days, right? And I love this chart from Joseph Pine's book, The Experience Economy, you know, where he talks about, you know, we've moved from commodities to goods to services, and now our economy is really an experiential economy, you know, very uh, topical for all the things that we're talking about. And he talks about creating great experiences you know, is really going to differentiate brands and enable brands to charge a premium, you know, for their services. So we're not quite there at charging a premium for laundry products yet, but the experience space is where we want to be with all these insights. And this experience that we create really should be an ecosystem. Um, one of the things that I really don't have a ton of patience for is, you know, seeing presentations where it's just a bunch of random tactics. You know, and nothing's really connected, and there's no real clear purpose. You know, what we're trying to do is move towards an ecosystem, right, that does three things simultaneously. It's prospecting, acquiring, uh, sorry, four things, retaining consumers, and trying to grow that user base by upselling and cross-selling. And so what that means is that every single point on a tactical plan has to have a clear reason for being and KPIs, and it has to be connected to other points so that we're creating an experience that feels frictionless, it feels value added, it feels personal, it feels like something consumers want to come back to. And when they're thinking about all the choices that they have, they think of our brands first because of this. 
right? Now, we've got technology, one technology stack is gonna, few, is gonna really support this, eco, this, this ecosystem. There'll be different brand stories and brand experiences, um, um, but one kind of tech stack, which includes a data lake, you know, a CIM and a content management system and data management platform and the CRM system. So the, the tech stack is super important. The partners that we work that we're working with are really, really important. And, um, and, and, and that's gonna be uh, a critical for us. But nothing is as critical as creative. This, is a, this chart comes from Nielsen and they did a study, I think it was a couple of years ago, and it was really important for us in our organization because it really shows of all the advertising levers we can pull, the most important one is not leveraging data and technology you know, for targeting. Targeting accounts for about 16% you know, of advertising sales contribution. Creative counts for almost 50%. So we can't take our, eye, our eyes off of the all important mission of developing great creative. From my perspective, I think these three companies do a wonderful job. Right, of building creative so powerful uh, that it just sucks people in. And in some cases, they're monetizing it. I think Red Bull probably makes more money from all the events and shows that they monetize than from the energy drink, and, and that's saying a lot. Um, I love Patagonia, you know, as I've mentioned to you before, but I think, you know, I think American Express is doing some really great things around content. And the neat thing that these companies are doing is they're starting in the middle of the funnel, right? They're starting with kind of that high engagement space, creating content first. Well, first creating a big idea, and then a content strategy that brings that idea to life. And that's where they start, right, with a narrative. And then they push out that content up the funnel and down the funnel. So for example, you've got Patagonia, and they create these really interesting videos that are so much fun to watch. You watch these ultra marathoners, and I was talking to, I think, Brett, where is he? He's not in this room. Uh, one of the guys here is an ultra marathoner. Really interesting videos, um, but they, they, they rejigger them. Um, they cut them down, and they are also you know, part of their TV campaigns, uh, part of their display advertising campaigns, you know? So they've got all this editorial content, long form videos, podcasts, editorials, infographs, user generated um, content, events, magazines. They start here, right? And they end up pushing out up and down the funnel versus I think what traditionally CPG companies could do is start with a TV commercial. You know, that leaves you in a very narrow place without a lot of places to move. Right? It's all about, in my view, big ideas that are so powerful that we can collect relationships. So if that's really what we believe, then we have to change how we behave. And we have to move away from becoming advertisers to becoming publishers of epic content that's so good, it's really better than anything else that people can find anywhere else. Um, we created a video series. Uh, for one of our beauty brands. I'll show you just a little bit of a teaser here uh, that, all, that fed the marketing mix. It basically followed a young woman as she was trying to break into the very male-dominated, competitive, electronic dance music DJing scene. Uh, that whole world is super relevant to Got To Be Customers, which is a hairstyling brand of ours, and kind of here's what that looked like. So you get the message. I don't want people dancing out of the room, so I'm gonna just to shut that down. Yeah, I, I see that we're, we're running, we're, I'm almost done running short on time. Um, but you could see in that video that we shot enough content, right, uh, to create a, a video series which was light on branding, um, but also could feed the marketing mix, right? Because we could shot enough branded content that we could do all sorts of, you know, we could do 30s, 15s, six second bumpers, display ads, GIFs, all kinds of things off of this content strategy. So it really fed the marketing mix and did quite well for us. Um, we're also partnering with this really fun guy. This guy's name is Jordan. He has a, uh, a blog called How to Dad. We stumbled across this guy. We did create a TV commercial with him first, but now we're thinking that this guy could be ripe for some content. Let's take a look.
Get out. How to Dan here to Dan with laundry. Now, don't let these little guys fool you. Pure X4 and one packs like tough stains without costing heaps. Even the shiny ketchup stain or the kids' shirts and napkin stains, the grass stain, it's a real bummer. The jelly on the belly, rhymes. And of course, the could be chocolate, really, really hope it's chocolate stain. Um, best not to touch that one. So, you know, we're going to take content ideas, you know, whether they come from upstream, downstream, in the middle, but we think that that guy's ripe for a video series. So we talked to Derek and uh, Chris earlier in a, in, a, in a session and going to definitely work with, uh, with Derek on something like that. So, I mean, I think it's all about, at the end of the day, in summary, really starting with big ideas that are powerful enough not only to motivate behavior change that we want, but to bring consumers into our brand and really collect relationships. Um, we want to leverage the unique capabilities of digital and data and technology to tell deep, rich brand stories that um, are, are based on a solid foundation of consumer insight. And we want to create responsive ecosystems of engagement, right, that create this virtuous cycle and tighten that loyalty loop. That's all I have for you today. We have a couple minutes if anybody has any questions or comments. Yeah. How, how's the challenge down the brands? Are they, you know, a different way to do business? Yeah. Are they engaging in it? They are. They are engaging in it. Um, it's, it, although it's not easy, you know, and it is about knowing your audience. And I thought that was very insightful, and that's was tr is true for us as well. It's knowing your audience, and some brands think differently than other brands, and you really need to tailor that message. More analytic people need to see more data. More visual people need to kind of see it, kind of see a sketch. Um, but we've been able to get people across uh, the line on content marketing and to get enough at least soil samples to prove this out. And once we uh, get all these results back, I think we're going to get a lot more of the brand teams really leaning into this approach. So along those lines, because we do have so many different brands intentionally, mm -hmm. um, how are you handling tone and voice in each of those? I'm sorry, how are we handling what? Tone and voice. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question. We talked about that earlier. So the, we, we've got most of the content we're creating is bespoke for a particular brand. So we're following brand guidelines in the brand you know, architecture. We have what we call an interagency team, right? The interagency team has a very important member of that team. And that team is what I've called before like the congressional whip, right? And that person is really empowered to make sure that we're not Frankensteining right, our creative messages, that it all holds together. And one of the exercises that we do is we pin up, you know, selects on the wall, and we stand back and we look at what this campaign really looks like, you know, throughout the path to purchase. Um, and that, uh, that helps us see, geez, are we creating a consistent yet nuanced message from media to shelf? One quick one. So uh, one of the struggles, I think, that Goods companies have right now is that retailers tend to own a lot of data that is useful really to the whole ecosystem that's evolving now and that starts with Amazon but goes to Walmart and What are you doing specific to uh, accumulate data of your own? You mentioned a couple of the cases there, but, but can you talk to specific uh, things that you're working on or thinking about? In that yeah, area? and the walled gardens too like to keep all that data to themselves as well. So we've decided we don't want, we, we want to. We don't want to rent relationships, we want to own them, right? So creating epic content um, that consumers are willing to kind of subscribe to in a newsletter, uh, participate in a CRM program, that's key to getting that deterministic registration you know, email, right? Registration data. We're also tagging up all of our media. We're work to get the cookies. Uh, we're working with mobile partners to get device IDs. So as I kind of indicated before, those are, those are the primary things that we're doing. The first party data is absolutely critical and our company globally is prioritizing CRM, right? And this whole approach of creating really powerful content that people will engage with and sign up for. And that's, that's really the primary driver of getting first party data. Plus we are investing in D2C companies. Um, Hankel is uh, very into mergers and acquisitions and, uh, and that's, that will help us as well. Okay, thank you very much.